Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, is that? We're now live, are we? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good. I, bl I believe we're live. Right. So I'll just um, scroll through to the introduction screen. You ready? Yep. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this innovation feature at the Water Equipment Show. My name is Dennis Goodlad, and I will be the moderator for this uh, presentation. The presentation is by Matt Theakstone from Schneider Electric, and he's going to describe the journey from secondary sensing capabilities to cloud analytics, so a very, a very topical subject. Um, so now, Matt, over to you, please. Yes, if you could just give me the nod that you're seeing my presentation. Yes, I can see it. Yeah, Let's great, thank you. So a warm welcome and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, as the title suggests, for this session, I'll be looking to address a subject, a journey from secondary sensing capabilities to uh, cloud analytics. And in doing so, I'll be exploring a, a number of topics, including, of course, secondary sensing, um, the communication of data, how to get data away from site. I'll be touching on cloud and discussing an analytical solution in this space. And as artificial intelligence and machine learning are, are transforming our industrial operations, I'll of course be including this as part of that conversation. All this really with a view to explore the subject of asset performance management and the role secondary sensing can play. So looking around the, the, the image of the, the water cycle uh, shown here on the screen, the role asset performance management isn't bound to any one part. In fact, as a subject, it is industry agnostic, but focusing specifically to a water system, irrespective of where the asset resides, be it a large water treatment works or a small single booster pump station, that the fact remains that assets need maintaining. They're there after all to do a function, they're, they're there planned for a role. So the goal is to have them perform that role as optimal as possible. And for that, we require a strong APM strategy. So to start today and set the context, I thought I'd share my view on the, the lay of the land with respect to the majority of organizations that I've interacted with and, and where they are with respect to their APM journey.
So the bottom two layers of the APM stack are the reactive and preventative maintenance levels. So reactive would see a, a corrective action carried out on an asset based on a, a critical event like a, a failure. And a typical example of this is an alarm in a SCADA system indicating a failure and therefore a member of the maintenance workforce will be dispatched to, re to resolve the fault. Now adopting only this method can be considered a, a run to failure maintenance strategy as no forewarning or attempts made to prevent or predict this failure were made. The next level we have is preventative and, and this is routine based maintenance based on time or usage statistics so doing the rounds undertaking maintenance activities as a penciled in the calendar in the form of run hours or the number of starts and should any of these be exceeded it then triggers again the need for a maintenance work order request but this time as it's time based these can often be planned now these two layers are where most people are right now but taking the reactive approach in isolation so only taking action when reacting to a report of an asset failure, the failure at that time could be catastrophic and it could have been avoided. What if the asset is critical in nature and now that it's faulted without prior knowledge, you're in a panic mode trying to resolve. Whilst it's reactive, it's not actually give you any time to plan. And taking the preventative approach on its own, it may help reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the chance of failure, but at what cost? How often are you servicing and maintaining an asset without the need to do so? You've got material spend, labor spend, and not to mention an over-maintained asset can actually increase its risk of failure. And what if the asset exhibits concerning behavior or a drop in performance in between maintenance cycles that if left causes irreparable damage? So the target for the most ideal maintenance strategy is to maintain only when necessary and when it is optimum for operations in the hope to eliminate unplanned downtime. And that's where the next tiers help. With condition-based maintenance, we're really talking about the creation of rules to help prompt a user to take action, to prevent an asset from failing, to help raise the alert that a, a condition has been detected that could lead to a failure and possible damage if not addressed. The next here is the predictive. Um, for the predictive, this is about leveraging machine learning AI technologies. And this technology can be used to provide machine learning to model the asset, to determine a model of known good behavior, and then to alert the user of any deviation from that. Now it's worth stating, that there's clear ambition from organizations there to make use of analytical and predictive technologies really to give the ability to look ahead to prevent costly or impactful failures. And finally, with risk based maintenance, it's about risk assessing the assets on both a likelihood of failure and a consequence of failure. RBM really requires a, a comprehensive maintenance infrastructure and makes use of the maintenance types that I've just discussed. Now it's important to note, all these different maintenance types are not to be used in isolation. They all have a part to play. Together, they help form an asset performance strategy, but you don't have to have all the above in place to start in the process. You can actually begin and expand on that journey right now. However, there's no escape in the fact that these technologies, these strategies rely on having the data, the data from the site processes, the existing installations and from the assets themselves. To get insights, we must be able to turn that data into information. And that kind of takes us nicely onto the next part. So what is one of the key challenges in this space? It's in the ability to provide a rich enough data set to accurately depict an asset and its behavior. The right data from a site enables us to calculate the original equipment effectiveness, the efficiency of our assets, to derive KPI values, to help us optimize our processes and reduce our energy expenditure. It helps us form a more complete view as to the situation occurring across our sites. And of course, having a good data set 
enables accurate and appropriate models to identify issues on assets and even forewarn on impending issues. And with such a capability in place, this facilitates the, the automatic production of work order requests, the benefits of which include an increase in the overall maintenance process efficiency and allows for forward planning of the corrective action. But as I said before, these technologies rely on having data. Now you may find the data you need is already available. Maybe you, you already have the data, but you're not doing anything with it with respect to condition based or predictive asset performance management. It's uncommon for utilities not to have a volume of data already at this layer. So if you have a telemetry solution for the supervisory control and monitoring, such as a GeoSCADA solution, either on premise or hosted as a managed service, you may, and it is a may, already be storing the required data. In which case, not only is it used for providing the holistic view of operations and alarms, all data is already consolidated and this simplifies the process of them feeding that data into the analytical platform. Perhaps you are sending the data into a data lake or another storage mechanism, be it again cloud or on premise. Perhaps it's a mixture of both. But the key thing is here, you have the data and therefore secondary sensing may not be required. But what if the data doesn't exist in a complete enough form? We can of course look to replacing any aged equipment on site and, and with the replacement ensure the required data is part of the solution. Equally, we, we could look to, uh, to add an impressive arrangement of sensors complete with dedicated monitoring solutions. But with this, we have to challenge our thoughts and ask whilst it might be appropriate for a few select assets of the highest criticality, something a, a risk-based maintenance strategy would help establish. The challenge then becomes one of scale and, and part of that is the economies of scale. Plus we, we must still get the results to the right people. So integration of the results is a factor too and that this is even more so a challenge if you've got many hundreds of assets that you're monitoring. So that's where we can look to add secondary sensing as a, an often non-intrusive alternative to get more data from the field, to connect more instruments and sensors, to extract additional readings from the existing installations and at the right price point. And it's in this space, largely with the explosion and adoption of IoT technologies that we are seeing huge growth. So imagine having a, a small battery operated magnetic device that you can walk up to an existing installation, stick it on it and start to get data from it straight away without touching the install base to have a near zero wiring footprint. So no downtime. Sounds pretty good. Well, shown here is an example of such a device. This example magnetically attaches the buzz bars, cables and even circuit breakers to report the temperature. It's a little green unit in the in the center of the picture. And there's a similar unit that reports current. Both are ideal for condition monitoring and for feeding into predictive models. For this application, the cheap sensor offers a solution where once a much more expensive and involved thermography solution may have been used. Also shown on the slide in the top right, is a device that monitors the active and reactive energy consumption and generation. The units below that report energy usage, continuity of service, and even reports on breaker status. And, and all this collected data supports an APM strategy by feeding into the condition-based rules or analytical models. Other examples of IoT sensors can detect on vibration metrics from assets such as pumps and motors, temperature readings, or determine humidity levels of an environment and help determine water levels. These help create a more complete picture of the assets or process. 
and applications of IoT sensors are, are, are numerous and we're, we're still discovering new opportunities all the time. A key point here is these are often retrospective, often non-intrusive options for increasing the data set recoverable from a site. It's all about forming that more complete picture of an asset or process. Many secondary sense in IoT solutions do not require invasive works that would disturb and disrupt the current site operations. But if we add these sensors and devices, what about the, the data transfer element? Secondary sensing is about increasing the data available, and that's irrespective of the destination of the data. However, the, the data has got to go somewhere for it to be useful. And if you have an existing SCADA telemetry layer, like a GeoSCADA deployment, you, you, you will have probably got the, the local devices that can be utilized to pass on the secondary sensing data. Uh, and this, this can include devices such as RTUs or loggers. And this is particularly useful for devices that don't possess their own WAN capabilities. In other words, those that do not operate on cellular or low power wide, wide area networks like Sigfox, LoRaWAN, NBIoT. Because without that capability, you're going to need a local device to gather the data from the sensors. And this is where the likes of a, a Zigbee hub coupled with an RTU or an edge box can come into play. And let's not forget, not all secondary sensing is purely for the purposes of asset performance management. It can help day-to-day -day operations to inform the control room that an action is needed or that an event is occurring. Secondary sensing can even be used as a validation that a user-driven uh, control has had the desired effect. So to have that data feeding into the SCADA or telemetry layer can actually prove useful. But in the absence of a telemetry solution or the desire to bypass that layer, we can look towards some other technologies and some secondary sensing solutions have the capability to transmit data over vast data distances built into them. So looking at low power WAN solutions like those that support LoRaWAN and Sigfox, allow transmission of small data packets over the air across a dedicated network with hops of up to 50 kilometers in distance. The recipient of data is, is often a database, be it a cloud hosted one or on premise. And in the instance of a cloud hosted solution, the data is then served as a, a data as a service model. And these solutions often come with their own GUI, so you can see your devices and the data they're reporting on a map or in a series of um, trends and, and charts. And we're also seeing instances of MQTT brokers being deployed instead of the more traditional database storage solutions. So with these, um, they allow SCADA telemetry and, and analytical solutions to register interests on topics and receive data when the broker receives the data from site. And what this gives is it provides great flexibility for the end user and allows them to decide what data is to be consumed by what solution. And one of the defining characteristics of solutions that adopt IoT technologies, such as MQTT and uh, low power one technologies, is really the lightweight communication. So as a result, some of these low power devices, are, are, they're often battery operated. They can actually run for years and in some instances over a decade transmitting data. So now we've we've covered uh, the adding of additional monitoring sensors and devices and address getting the data off site. What about the, the analytics itself? So what I'd like to do now is um, just explore the, uh, the the Aviva Insight solution. Well, or more accurately, the, the APM components of that. So Insight is a operations and asset management platform in the cloud. It's industry agnostic, it stores data, it has strong APM capabilities, it has an optionally configured OE calculation engine, and it even provides self-serve dashboards. And users can even create displays and um, using the same graphics that's on the, the plant scaders, 
um, in, in this solution. So you're able to use the same symbols as a, the SCADA platform. And with it being a, a cloud hosted analytical solution, it, it, it must and has the ability of ingesting data from many sources. And these can be multiple feeds at any one time, be it from the plant system, a centralized SCADA platform, a data lake, and of course those uh, that I've already mentioned. Now with the data centralized, it's accessible to the wider organizations that can provide that user separation from those that need monitoring and control ability and from those that just need to see the data. And as it's cloud-based, provides information to whomever and wherever it's needed to support better management of the assets, whatever device they may be using. But focusing on the APM elements, there are four elements to the APM solution as part of Insight that I'd like to explore now. And I stated at the beginning, these are complementary to each other. Each has a most practical use case that needs to be evaluated for each scenario. So starting with automated, Insight will start to learn from the data straight away. The automated analytics do not require any setup your insight will start to recognize a data's pattern and raise a notification to the user when the behavior is not as expected. With large systems having over tens or even hundreds of thousands of tags, noticing deviations from the normal behavior is hard for a human to do, especially if the tag is operating within the alarm limits. Automated analytics and insight does all this for you. So when connecting into Insight, either via the, the web interface or through the mobile app, a user is presented with the landing page. And on here, all user created dashboards are shown, plus those that have been shared as part of the team. Also shown on here is an area called Newsfeed. And this is where the user is fed notifications of detected discrepancies of data, data that is not adhering to past behavior. The information is presented as a trend with the, the questionable value has been shown as red markers. The image on, on, on the screen is actually showing an example of this. Now this technology, these algorithms actually learn and they learn from your feedback. So if you feel the notification is a valid use case, you can hit the thumbs up. The algorithms will learn from that and they'll continue to report future uh, instances of that event. If not, hit the down thumb and it'll no longer report a future occurrence or uh, similar in nature because it'll learn that that behavior is actually um, quite valid. Condition-based APM is really the creation of rules now. So these can be manually configured or you can use a pass incident as a base for a rule creation. The idea being that if you know what the warning signs are for an asset, you can configure a rule to catch that incident and to alert on it. And these are multivariable rules and the user can state what the resultant action should be. Alert themselves, a team, send an email or even raise a work order request. And as I just mentioned before, you can create a rule based on a past event. So trending the data for the period in which the first warning of the required action occurred allows a rule to be created simply by clicking the alert icon. And this brings in the required information into the rule. So there's no programming needed. It's very simple, yet it's very powerful. And with each rule, a prescriptive action can even be configured. Now a prescriptive action allows the configurator to inform what the detected rule break is indicating and document the steps to fix. So not only can the solution alert to a rule break, but the user or team can be told the likely cause and the corrective action. With Guided and Advanced, we're now looking at machine learning AI technologies. So I'm gonna start by looking at um, the Guided first. The idea to provide machine learning to model the asset, arrive at a model of known good behavior, then any deviations from that to alert the user. In the video, you, you see how a guided analytic, uh, analytic model is created for a motor. And you'll also note that Insight just simply walks the user through the process. So you'll note that 
just how quick and easy it is to get going with this once your data is actually in the platform. So this is using the guided analytic function. You select the tags that represent an asset, and this can include the secondary sensing data that I've uh, I discussed earlier. You then allow the system to train based on the recorded historical data. And you, you'll see there's a number of filters that can be applied. So you can apply a filter to only operate the model under a given scenario, such as when the pump power indicates a pump is running, for example. Now in the video, we skipped over the operational uh, mode configuration, but this effectively allows tags to indicate when a different product or SKU is going through the, the, the asset. So if it affects the viscosity, you might want to create a separate model for that. But what about the results? So for, for guided, the results were in the form of a, an anom anomaly score, and this is an indication of how normal the behavior was over the last two hours. So the system highlights the tags contributing to the anomaly score, shows the user where the offending tags or tag uh, cause a concern and shows it on a trend. Um, and the top three tags, or up to three that is, uh, contributing to the anomaly are indicated. And then clicking on the bar chart itself brings up a trend of the contributing tags and it highlights the area um, of where that score was the highest. And with the score being recorded against each model, a user can then be create uh, can then create um, a rule, right? So then um, that rule can not only alert to that uh, further instances of that in the future, but the rule can then raise a notification to the, the individual, to the team, or even raise a work order. Advanced analytics is targeted towards assets and processes that are complex or considered extremely critical. And this allows models to be created by, by selecting tags, just like guided. However, a user is unable to tune the model or select the model type to focus on an area, be it to reduce downtime, increase asset reliability, help maintain quality, or even look at useful remaining life. So think of advanced as more predicting quality, predicting failure, whereas um, guided is more about anomaly detection. The principle being advanced analytics gives the ability to define models that are deployed to ensure they are fit for purpose. There's still no need to be a data scientist to use um, the, this analytical feature, but tuning the model may be required depending on the solution chosen. So with that, I'll wrap my slides up today. Um, we've explored how to collect extra data using secondary sensing. Uh, we, we looked at how to get that collected data off site, and then we looked at the storage of that data and how that can feed into the analytical platform. And with a focus on the APM modules, that explores some technologies that are out there right now that actually exist, that are being used now. And with that, we covered the condition-based maintenance, so built on rules. And these rules can be quite simple, single variable, or they can be complex with multivariables. In either case, we're talking here about a rules-based logic um, using sensors uh, real-time data. For example, a rule can be created to compare values of multiple sensors that can help indicate an impending fault, a high load, a high temperature, yet low output, for example. And we looked at machine learning capability, one of the most frequent occurring issues that can lead to the failure of an industrial motor or warm bearings. Uh, when a bearing becomes worn, it'll often move slower, grow hotter, and become generally less efficient. This example would be alerted to by the AI algorithms within such a solution. And these technologies utilize sensor data from the field or the asset in combination with machine learning AI technologies to spot even the smallest patterns of deviations in advance of any human detection so that early warning is provided. And then finally, we, we looked at advanced analytics and how the technology has evolved so that not only are we able to predict when a failure is likely to occur, we're able to run analytics with a targeted aim to increase asset reliability, help maintain quality, look at useful remaining life and minimize energy spend. So the technology is here to allow process optimizations beyond asset health. So that's me 
finished. Um, I hope it's been interesting. And if we have time, now is uh, the q and I believe. But if not, feel free to re reach out to me. I'd genuinely love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, th thanks very much, Matt. That was a, a, a very interesting presentation. I, if, if I could understand the half of it, I, I think I'd be doing well. There's some quite um, new high tech stuff there. Um, not many questions and we're nearly out of time, but one question would, would be how easily or how can the platform, your platform be integrated into the existing um, IT infrastructure in, in your client companies? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to quickly jump back to this slide here. So one of the core focus points for our Aviva Insight is just how easy it is to get going with it. It's really quite simple. And if you've got um, solutions like SciTech SCADA or Plant SCADA is now called, you've got Wonderware Systems or you've got uh, Geo SCADA, they've actually all got publishers built into them. So they can send data into Aviva Insight encrypted comms right now. Um, but failing that, you can see there's a, a myriad of ways of getting data into Insight, be it from on-premise or even uh, cloud solutions. And with things like the OI driver collection set that they've got, um, I mean, the list a few there in the, in, in the center, you're able to talk and get data straight from the PLCs or the DCS system if so wish. So really getting data into Insight is very, very simplified. And uh, if anyone wants to know more, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to have a look at their infrastructure, their setup, and uh, see how we can take it from there. Great, thank you. Um, one very quick question. The second, this concept of secondary sensing, will that replace traditional telemetry systems? Um, in a nutshell, no, I don't think so. Um, not in the vast majority of cases. RTUs gather far greater data sets and at a higher data rate than the technologies uh, we've discussed here. And that's because RTUs pull data from site sensors and plant assets, but they, they also connect into devices like PLCs and VSDs. Uh, plus they have things like store and forward capabilities. So they ensure data isn't lost if not successfully transferred. And that's something that in the water industry can carry penalties. Um, I see secondary sensing as complementary. Uh, it helps provide additional data, but it's often at a much reduced rate. Um, oh, and RTU support things like control and logic too. So um, something IoT sensors, they, they don't do that. So if you want localized intelligence with controllability, RTUs are again the choice over uh, secondary sensing. So I, I see them as complementary, but I don't see them as uh, replacing RTUs, no. Great, well, thank, thanks very much, Martin. Th thank you for keep, keeping to the time. You're spot on there. No um, and th thanks as well to everybody who's attended this, this presentation. Uh, Matt is available at the Schneider Electric stand, I guess, for the rest of the day to, to talk in more in depth about this and to answer any more questions. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Dennis. Yes, yeah, he's still, he's still there. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I can. Um, I just have to escape from that, and I'm back. I turn the and the camera on again. You want to click the end? Then oh, the, yeah, the the end button can. Do.